Today I'd like to do a quick introductory video on Darktable for Digital Photography 1. And the reason I want to use Darktable and the reason I want to show it off is that it is free. It is also cross-platform, which means it will work on Windows, Mac, or PC, so kind of whatever you get used to it on, uh, you can then go to another computer and work with it just as easily. Do be aware that at some things do work better on Windows or Linux or Mac, uh, and that's just going to be an issue of cross-platform software. This specifically is running on Windows, as you can see by that little taskbar at the bottom, which means that some things that were written, I believe this was written natively for Linux, but some things that are written natively for Linux will not work quite as well in Windows, so you will see a little bit of lag time as I do things which I do not have if I use it on a Linux partition. So this is the basic dark table interface that you open up to. Here's the five photographs that we are going to use today. Some of this stuff on the sides is settings that I've already used for other things. I didn't really want to do a fresh install of Darktable as it would mess up all my settings. One thing to be really clear about is Darktable is great for editing and it's great for organizing within like one shoot but it's not really a photo organization program. So the way that Darktable generally works is that you will import up here based on either pulling in a single image and editing it or pulling in a folder. I generally pull in a folder and the reason I pull in the folder is because I have my camera set to shoot and save images into folders based on day. So if I don't go shoot for an entire day, it doesn't make a new folder, but if I go shoot on a Saturday, it will make a folder for that date. And then it will put all the photographs it took that day into that date. And then if I take pictures on Sunday, it will make a new folder and start putting all the pictures in there as well. The advantage of that is then if I go on a vacation or something like that and I have three days, right, I knew I went Friday, Saturday, Sunday, well, then I know that I can just take those three folders and dump all the images in those three folders into one or take just one of those days and I can have all of the stuff from that vacation in one folder. There are programs that do this sort of organization much simpler and easier but I find that those get problematic when they get particularly big. Things like iPhoto are absolutely wonderful but for those of you that have switched computers with iPhoto and had it go badly, you know that sometimes that ease of use does not equate to ease of transition or ease of failure. So do be aware that this does use a foldered system, so you do kind of have to generate your own folder structure, however it makes you happy. But once you have that, you'll be presented with an interface like this. I'm going to go to that folder, and you can see basic folder structure. I believe this is, yeah, this is my computer, desktop, and then this is that folder structure for the day that I took these pictures. Uh, it's kind of a random string, I think it's, yeah, November 8th right there. Um, and then these are the raw images, and then you will see these XMP file types. What the XMPs are is that Darktable constructs a separate file and saves it right alongside your raw file and that tells Darktable all the edits that, that you've made. So if I close out a Darktable and open it up again, or if I save out this folder and I put it on a flash drive and I take it to another computer and I open it in Darktable, it will remember all of the edits that I've made in these XMP files. So if you see a bunch of these weird little tiny files that say .xmp, don't worry, those aren't. there's no problem with that. that that's just Darktable's way of saving data off to the side of your image so it doesn't mess with your original raw image. I like having import folders recursively turned on. That means so if I have folders within folders it'll just suck all the images out of everything. I also have it generally set to ignore JPEG files. Some people will shoot with their camera where they shoot both a raw and a JPEG at the same time. Generally those JPEGs are used for wireless transfer and things like that but you don't really want to have just two copies of everything. So you can set 
Darktable to ignore just the JPEG. You can apply all of this stuff. I generally don't bother, but you can totally do that. So you can put in all your rights, the title of the images, the creator, which would be you, and all of that stuff can be put in right there. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to select this folder, which gives me all this stuff, and I'm going to hit open. Of course, it didn't do anything because I already had this folder open, and this folder has these five images in it. I just took some, just went outside and took, and, took, and took some representative images just to give you guys an idea of kind of how I would go through and edit these. First thing with Darktable is as I hover over one of these, you can see metadata come up, i.e. all the data about the picture that was taken, and the name of the picture, and so on and so forth. But at the bottom, you see that there's an X and there's five stars. The stars are nice because if you hover your mouse over, see how it kind of highlights that image as, as different? If you hover over and then you use the keys one through five on your keyboard, you can set the number of stars. See how I set that one to four, now to two, four again, set it back to one. What that allows is that allows you to sort images by how much you like them, right? You go through, say you only need two pictures for a weekend, you can go through very quickly and just find the pictures that you really, really like, star them really high, like let's say I do want this one, I can star it to two. Say I do want this one, I can star it to two, and I can star this one to two. And then up here you'll see this view, and then our operator, and then this. So this lets us view, we just want our two stars, so that just shows me my two stars. It hasn't deleted the other images, they're not, they haven't gone anywhere, but it allows me to see just those ones. Now, this is our operator, right? These are less than, less than or equal to, equal to, greater than or equal to, greater than, not equal to, uh, just for those of you that, that haven't done it, an, e an equal sign with a slash to it, or slash through it, means not equal to. So if you want everything except one stars, you can totally do that. One thing you'll see here is there's a rejected only. One thing that I like to do is I will go through the first time, like let's say I have a few hundred pictures I took, I'll go through the first time and just get rid of everything that's a bad frame or is out of focus or is blurry or is some unrecoverable, unesthetic thing that I just don't like. So anytime I see that, like let's say these two images, I know that these two are identical, except for the fact that I rotated very slightly to get the edge of the house out of the picture. See how there's just a little bit of it here, and there's more of it here. So in this case, this picture, I don't want it at all. I can just tap the R key on my keyboard, and that will reject it. If I actually want to delete that file, I can go View, Rejected Only, I can control, now you can see that this has that little X, that means rejected. Now I can control A, which is select all, or I can select all with this button right here. And then I can very easily pop this and trash, right? Trash will actually get rid of the image and throw it in trash on your computer and then you can empty your trash from there. But remember, this is not a an organization program really, right? It's just gonna use the organization system that your computer has built in. It's just doing these XMP files on the side, but it does allow you to shove images to trash, so we are going to do that because I do not want this image. Yes. So now, if you ever see this, it just means that you either don't have any images in this folder, or you've set this to a restricted setting that doesn't show you any of your images. We want one stars to show us our pictures. This is sort of our file editor window. There's a few other things we can do. You'll notice that there's these arrows all around. If you want more or less data on each side, you can hit those little arrows. I'm gonna bring this one up, just because I like this little thing right here. And if you notice, there's this big bar with five next to it. And what that means is it's gonna try to show me five images next to each other. I don't have five images, so it's leaving me a blank space. But what I can do is if I want to see more, if I want to see more of my images, right, if I want to see them bigger, I can scroll my scroll wheel, right, it's very hard to slide a little slider le um, left and right accurately here, 
but I can scroll my scroll wheel up and down and it will give me more or less in one unit increments. So I can have two, so if I want to be more comparative with my images, I can do that. If I want to see more images all at once, all I have to do is make it upset so it freaks out. And then it will give me all my images, right? Four, it shows me four across. If I want three, it can show me three across. It's just kind of whatever size image makes it easy for you to see what's going on. The nice thing here is it also has moved our our metadata to down here. Let's go ahead and edit this picture. The way we edit a picture is you can select it. You can just double click it. It's the easiest way. Just double click. It'll pop it into a window with different stuff. It's a little bit similar on this side, but it has totally different stuff on the side over here. You'll see that it gives us all of our pictures at the bottom. I kind of think this is a waste of space because once I'm in this mode, I really just want to do edits. So what I can do is again, this arrow down here, tap it once, got rid of that first bit, tap it again, we'll get rid of the rest of that bottom pane so I can make my picture even bigger. And I want a big picture because I'm editing this picture. Now we can see, oh, let me, um, sorry. So, this, these allow you to see only active modules. This shows only your favorite, mo your favorite modules, right, the star. And these are just the ones that I like to use, so they go in here. These are each one of the types, basic group, tone, color, correction, effects. I pretty much just put the handful of things that I use in here, and then I use them out of here. If I want more modules, all I do is I click the more modules and then I can go through here find the thing that I'm looking to do so let's say if I want a um, hmm. hot pixels is not something I generally deal with but let's say I wanted it all I have to do is click click again and on the second click it will add that star and that star means it added it to my favorites. Click it again, it will remove it from my, fa my, from my favorites. So I can very easily just say, hey, these are the things that I want to use, go through, find all the stuff that I want, get rid of all the stuff that I don't want. So if I find something that I don't use, let's say I don't use, I use tone curves sometimes, but not often, let's see. Oh, I actually use most of this stuff, so I'm gonna leave it all alone, but I could remove it if I want to, and then poke that arrow and it will put the more modules down here where it's hidden and out of the way. I generally don't mess with module order. There is actually some reasoning for the order that they're in in Darktable, so I would leave them alone if you can. Uh, if it really bugs you, then of course change it, but I wouldn't worry about it. You can see in here that we have a few things that are already on. White balance is gonna kind of be on by default because these are raw files and they are not what we think they are. Highlight reconstruction is the same. Uh, that is to fix some of the things of, trans of, of transforming a raw file into the image that we actually look at. You will see that base curve is also on. The base curve is what Darktable thinks your camera needs to look the way it's supposed to, right? So there is a way that like Sony intends the image to be in my camera as a Sony. There's a way that Sony intends the image to be, and this base curve tells you kind of how far off that original RAW to what Sony's intent is, or to what Darktable's intent is. And you can see that this curve is pretty aggressive. And if you go to this, the presets, you can see that there are a bunch of different presets for all the different cameras. Mine is a Sony Alpha, so it's Sony Alpha-like. And as you see, everybody's got their own. Some individual cameras even have more specific versions of these, right? Like there's Nikon and Nikon-like Nikon alternate. Same thing with, K with the Canon EOS and EOS-like alternate. This is the base curve that the Darktable people have put together to make your camera's images look correct to them. I actually do not like this. I find it over-contrasts the images that I use. 
but I like very flat, very low contrast images. So a curve that's this kind of modified S-curve, this is a very high contrast curve. And I'm not really a fan of that, so I'm going to turn this one off. But before I do that, I want to talk about one more little window we have. And this little window here is a histogram. And it's a three color histogram in that we can see the peaks of the colors coming out differently. With this, I can see that right now most of my image is dark, right? So if I look at the left side of this little hill, I have more stuff over to the left of the window than I do to the right of the window. And I can see that I actually have no white at all, right? There's nothing even approaching a full white over here. All of my colors start at about 75% and work their way down towards dark. So I can kind of use that to see this image looks dark to me. Okay, well this histogram also looks dark to me. So I can use these two things to kind of verify against each other that whatever I'm doing in here is actually working and is kind of doing what I think it should do. So with this, I'm going to turn off base curve. Turn off the base curve. If I reset the base curve, I can reset the parameters. This is what it would give me. This is a zero curve. Right? There, there's no modification to this curve. If you don't edit the image at all, you end up with a line from bottom left to top right. You can see if I set Sony Alpha-like, see that big hump? That's going to increase contrast quite a bit, especially through the mids and brights. I do not want that, so I'm just going to turn this guy off. And then if I want to make this module small, all I do is click in the title bar and it will make that module small so I can look through the rest of my stuff. Now this image is very dark. It's gotten even darker now that I turned the base curve off, right? We were way out here with our histogram, but now we are down to maybe 55 to 60% as opposed to that 75% that we were over here. This is where we get into stuff that we just like. I'm just going to talk about the way that I like to do this because you're going to have certain goals. You're going to have things that you think look good and right in a picture and you want them to be like that. Mine are going to be very, very different than yours. Mine are going to be very different depending on what I'm trying for. So if we look at what, let's, let's try for like a real estate photograph with this. So a real estate photograph is going to be very sharp. It's going to be bright. It's going to be relatively colorful. It's not going to have a lot of artistic interpretation to it. It's going to just kind of pop like on Zillow or something like that. So we don't even need a lot of detail because most people are going to be seeing this image online. The first thing that I can see that I know is going to be a problem is all of this shadow from the tree, right? All of the underside of this tree is very dark and this shadow on the house is very dark. If I was taking this picture for real for real estate, I would be shooting when the sun is in the east. Right now the sun is just very slightly to the west. This porch is south facing this way. So you can get an idea that the sun is coming from over here and casting a shadow. If I really wanted this picture, I would do it in the morning when the sun is coming from this direction and it would light this face, more of this face, this face, and this face without shadows. But we're gonna deal with what we have. One of the easiest and most abused things you can do is just shadows and highlights. What shadows and highlights does is it increases the contrast in just the shadows and in just the highlight areas, and it moves those areas a little bit towards the middle, so we get a little bit of bright of brightness in those. So you can see the difference. I can just turn that module on and off. You can see it opened up quite a bit. We can also watch our histogram. And we can see that our histogram does the exact same thing. It opens up towards the brightness. So we can pop that on. If I want more details in my shadows and highlights, I can just open this up. Right? I can go shadows plus 100. We can see that that looks weird, right? We get, we get this horrible, strange shadow thing that looks like an HDR photograph. We get some weird colors over here. We definitely get some weird colors in this face. So I think plus 100 is a little aggressive plus 50 is what it was set at. If I want to reset the parameters, I just hit that little, I swear, what looks like a Mario coin right there, and that will reset the parameters of a module. 
So I can close down that module because I think that this has given us enough. If I need more, we can go back and do that. While it's very, very simple, I think that levels is honestly a great tool. I can open levels and you don't even need to turn a, mo a module on. If you start messing with the things inside the module, it will automatically turn it on and then you can manually turn the module on or off from here. So if I want to, I can turn it on or if I turn it off, I can just start playing with this and you can see that it turned it on automatically. Now you can see a slightly simpler version of this histogram up here without the color information. You can see that here. You can also see these three lines. This is my black point, this is my white point, and this is my middle gray point. So I can move these around to adjust in my image where white, where gray, and where black ends up being. What I want to do is I know that I do want some white in this image. I don't want a gray image. So I'm gonna, I can grab my white point and I can just move it. And anything to this side of this will be pure white. And because I do have some white areas in this image, I'm not really worried about blowing those out, right? There's no real detail in the face here. I don't really need to worry about it in the same way that I would worry about like a person's skin, where I would be more concerned about blowing out those highlights. I don't have to worry about any highlights back here. This is all pretty darker, or at least darker than this, so I'm not worried about blowing those out either. Now when I look up at this histogram up here, it's looking much, much more even. Now, this is still dark. This face is dark, this side is dark. This is still a dark image. It's much better than it was, but it's still dark. So what I can do is take this gray point and I can move it. But I don't like just clicking and dragging it because I think that it moves too fast and I don't like that. So what I'm going to do, do is use the scroll wheel on my mouse again, and I'm just going to roll the scroll wheel down, and that allows me to do these really nice, fine, single-step moves. So I kind of like... That's a little bright. So to get the middle out, I had to bring this way, way down here. So you can see that I'm actually losing some weird stuff in the, in the blacks here. You can see that my colors are starting to separate in the blacks. So I can bring my blacks up a point or two and fix that color separation. And then up here with the whites, I can say, well, maybe I actually don't want it quite like that. So I can actually back off on my ultra bright, bright whites. You can see that I'm getting that color separation, but that's probably okay on this end. And all I have to do is kind of hover, and you can see that each one highlights as I get somewhere near it. And as long as it highlights, then I can roll my scroll wheel to adjust it finely. So I'm going to do that to adjust this. It's very nice, very easy. But once I'm done with this, I can make that go away. And now we can see we have this very clean histogram. It's almost box-shaped histogram. So a box-shaped histogram is probably going to look a little bit brighter than reality, a little bit more contrasty than reality. But just be aware that if, if this is all left, it's going to be dark. If this is all right, it's going to be very, very bright. If this is this shape in the middle, you're going to have a what most people would consider a very normal image. A box shape image is kind of going to give you a more modern, like a, like a HDR type look. And that also depends a lot on what your subject is, right? Like if you take a picture of something that's very high contrast, you're going to get a double hump kind of histogram, and that's totally okay. It's just what you're going for in your image and what you're taking a picture of. Now, I can see that this is a very bright structure to start with, but I have some more high saturation stuff than I think I would like up here. So if I want to mess with that, I can come into here and I can get just a general gross saturation right here. I'm not going to mess with contrast and brightness because I personally prefer using that levels tool to get what the equivalent of contrast and brightness is. If I move these outside two closer together, I get more contrast. If I move all of them left, I get more brightness. So if I move all of them right, I get less brightness. So we can kind of do that to, you know, not have to use these tools. Those are fine. Saturation, I do like to use in here, especially if I want to reduce saturation. So I want to knock saturation down quite a bit. 
And what that's going to do is it pulls a little bit of the purple out of these back here, pulls a little bit of the purple out of this up here. And I can show you that. It's actually a little bit more blue here. So I can turn it off. I can turn it on. And that's the nice thing is you can flip these on and off. This also tones down the sky a little bit. Right, if I want to bring your focus in on this house, I might want to actually tone down the sky slightly. This might be too much, but we're going to find out. Now, saturation just reduces the color contrast across the board and evenly. If I want to make just the soft colors light, right, the colors that are towards the middle, that are towards brown and gray, if I want to brighten those up, without affecting colors that are already very bright, right? Like these greens are still extremely bright. If I want to affect some of these more subtle tones and make them brighter or make them more sat more saturated without affecting the already bright stuff, then I use this very nice tool called Velvia. And the Velvia tool is automatically set at one quarter strength. So we are gonna turn this on and just see what happens very subtle but you can see that it's blued up some of this it's added a little bit of green it's brought this up and it's kind of flattened out the sky very slightly so I actually like if I'm shooting something really really bright like this I actually like this combination of yanking saturation down just a little bit and then pumping up the middle colors with Velvia and that gives me a kind of flatter tonal range across the image and it looks a little bit synthetic, but that's kind of what you're going for with these really like high punch real estate Im um, images. So that's something to think about, right? If I was doing this for wedding photography, I would not, you know, have these ultra bright punchy colors because I would want something more subtle, soft, and magical. For house stuff, you just want, at least what I'm looking for, is this big, bright, punchy assembly of, of colors and contrasts. If I want more punch and more local contrast, there's two good ways to do it now. One of them is very specifically called local contrast. One issue i found is if you use local contrast and shadows and highlights at the same time, you run the risk of halos in your images really aggressively. So anywhere where there's a harsh contrast, you'll get kind of a bright area and then it will fall off towards dark again. So here we'll probably end up with dark, light, dark, as opposed to, you know, the more natural image where this is actually all the same color and then it gets immediately dark. But we can try. So local contrast, you can see the punchiness. Right? All the darks really crank down. Now they actually crank down kind of a little bit too much for, for what, what we're doing here, but it does punch up the house a little bit. We can now go and check levels and pull up those blacks. See now my black is all the way across and I've recovered a little bit of the um, I've recovered a little bit of the detail in the shadows here and over here. So local contrast kind of just punches your image up a little bit. If I turn that off, turn it on, and see that this is mostly happening in the dark areas, but it is very, very nice for that. One tool that I've also found that's very useful, especially if you're if, if you're a person that uses older lenses that aren't really high contrast to start with, this lens is a very cheap wide angle lens and does not have great contrast. This haze remove this haze removal tool oftentimes works very, very well as just a you know, add a little bit of punch tool. So I'm going to click this on. One thing I've also found is it darkens up the image a little bit and adds a little bit more color. So in my opinion, that has gone like almost cartoonishly bright, especially in here. We're starting to get some really weird, see that dark line, that, that shadow right there? That's completely fake. So if we take that off, see how that's going away? So I know that by using combinations of these tools, I'm gonna to get some aggressive haloing. And again, halos are just high contrast areas that are affected. They can be towards the dark or towards the light. It doesn't really matter. Both work. This, in my opinion, is pretty good start. Of course, if I was doing a real real estate photograph, I would have just, you know, brushed the leaves off of the front steps, but I didn't do that. And I would have shot in the morning when I didn't have to worry about this shadow over here. But this photograph 
while not perfect, is pretty good. Let's work on a, another photograph. One thing we are not going to mess with is some of the denoise features. The denoise features are very nice, but I'll make a separate video of this just really quick about those because they are so useful in Darktable. So to get back to where all the other photographs are, I have two options. I can either double click on this gray area, which is what I usually do, or I can bring this up and I can play with this image down here. I've, I've taken two of these images. One I took at a, at a uh, smaller aperture, so I actually got a good exposure where this is not blown out. Then this image I took at a much more open aperture that my camera was not able to go fast enough and I actually did blow out some of this white. You can see from the base histogram the base histogram is already a little bit, is already significantly more square than the other image, which means I probably have more detail here in the darks, but I've lost detail on these face structures right here. I might not need those face structures. I also have a little bit of glow. You can see some glow around here, and that's simply because that lens, as I said, is not very good. So you're getting a little bit of glow. If I want to look more closely at this image, I can roll in and I can roll out on my on my scroll wheel. I can also go over here and I can set the percentage value. Fit to screen is generally what you're gonna do, right? It fits it on the screen. 50% is where every one pixel on the screen represents two pixels in the image. 100% is one pixel on screen represents one pixel on the image. 200% is every t every two pixels on screen in a line represent one picture one pixel on the image and then here on this little sampler you can see that we are only seeing this part of the image so we can use this to move around where that might be easier and you can see the absolute horrendous glow off of this relatively cheap lens see all this white out here Oh, see all this white out here? You can see that that lens does not control flare very well and does not control glow very well. So let's very quickly edit up this image. That looks like an all right edit, especially for a quick edit for this image. And now we can go back to our light table where we can see both of those and I can see kind of which one I like keep the one I like or I can decide oh well this one's not quite as bright I didn't do it quite to the extent I did this one too so let's bring this one up some more and that's probably getting a little closer so I can see do I like my image that I shot dark and brought up or do I like my image that I shot brighter and has a little bit of this extra glow but it also keeps a little bit more true colors through here. You can see that we're getting some red funk in here, and that's generally from bringing up the darks that aggressively, you're gonna get some weird colors, and this one does not have quite as much of that. So really, a lot of this is what goal you have for your image, both end up looking okay. Let's move on to some of these two that have different goals. I, again, double clicked on that to get rid of this. I'm going to put those arrows down. We can see here that I have a far less contrasty image, right? I'm starting with a much smaller hump and I can see that I have no true blacks and no true whites. Generally, if a lens starts to fall off and not have true, true blacks, especially if you're shooting at a slightly negative exposure like I do, I usually shoot at negative 0.7. What that does is it allows me that some freedom in those highlights. But if you see a lens that does this and doesn't quite touch both sides, you can kind of guess that that's going to be a lower contrast lens. This lens is a 50 millimeter f1.1, very bright, very nice, but it's got garbage contrast. And especially for local contrast, it's even worse. When we go in here, we can see that these are just barely in focus and the contrast is incredibly low. That's okay though. That's why we have photo editors to abuse our images. The one thing I kind of screwed up in this image is there's a little bit of highlight where the sun was coming through the bushes back here. That's a little bit distracting in my image. 
I'm not really going to worry about it for the purposes of this, but that is something that I would take out if, if this image was going to go to, you know, anywhere. First things first, I dislike the base curve. You might like your base curve. Leave it on if you like it. Leave it on if you like it. See that this got even taller? That's okay. Shadows and highlights. I don't really have dark shadows in this. I don't really have bright highlights. So this tool doesn't really do much for me. I'll show you what it does though. It kind of pops up that background. But I actually like the fact that this section is bright and some of this starts to get darker. So I'm not going to use that tool. Local contrast. Let's see what that does. And a lot of this is just playing with your tools and just seeing what kind of floats your boat. Local contrast, that's fantastic. It has helped us out immensely here. But I want you to look at this line right here. Look at, there's a, there's a, you know, a bit of a bush here that's, that's lighter colored. And I want you to look at the edge of the out of, fo of the out of focus. When I turn off local contrast, this just smooths out and kind of goes into the background. When I turn it on, you can all of a sudden really see that line. It's much more aggressive, it's much more obvious. So if you shoot stuff with that really low depth of field, tools like local contrast can really actually mess up your image. So I'm gonna leave that off and see if I can get a good image without it because these two I think are gonna mess up my image. Let's start again with levels. Let's just see if we can get a good image out of that. So I know that I want you know, I want my image to go to almost fully black and I want my image to go almost to fully white. So I can very quickly... The thing that I kind of watch out for is when these bottom edges, or, you know, top edges, whatever dark edge you have on, on a lens that has a netting that's this bad, I look in those darks and as soon as those darks start to crush, where certain sections all look the same, then I'll back off one or two points and then that'll, then that'll look good, right? As long as this still has a gradient and doesn't just have like a chunky edge to it, then you are okay. So I just back it off a little bit just to make sure that that's the case. I have loads of space up here. So I can bring this just way, way out. Now if I want like a dark moody image, I can totally do that. But I want this, you know, these are flowers. I kind of want these to be bright. So I can do that. I can see that I'm nowhere near my blacks now that I've brought all this stuff up. I can pop this down a little bit more. You can see that this is starting to crush, so I'm going to leave that alone. We can see up here that we're getting very, very close to that pure black. And now with this middle, do I want the image to be bright? Right? I can take it like very wedding photograph. Very, I don't know, hyper real. Or I can moody it up. Right? I can make a really moody image. Let's say that I want the moody image. Let's say that I want to do something a little bit different than the last one. I want something moody. Well, I can take this middle point and shove it down. And what that's going to do is it's going to bring all these mid-tones really, really dark. We can see the shape of our histogram has moved, right? The hump on our camel's back is going towards dark. So I'm going to darken this way, way up. I'm going to open up our darks just a little bit, just to maintain these corners. Now I like this, right? This is giving me something very, very nice. I now have a lot of contrast up here, so again, I would pull this out. But for right now, not going to mess with that. This, very nice, very bright, gives me a really good contrast versus this background area. I'm going to close levels for right now, and I'm going to start playing with some of my stuff. So I love these purples in here, right? These are really low, pur uh, the purple and green and yellow. And I could do the brightness and saturation. I could bring sat just bring saturation up, right? And that's bringing up saturation through everything equally. That actually looks okay. I'm not, I'm not a big fan, but I'm not sad about it either. But I'm going to try my preferred tool, which is Velvia, and I'm going to turn that guy on. We can see that it's really bumped these, and it's also bumped some of these greens in the back. I'm okay with that. So I'm going to bump my strength of Velvia up to 50. Maybe even a little bit more. Now that's pretty aggressive through here, and I kind of like that. So let's see it with Velvia off. I can just turn the power button. Looks almost gray tone now. Turn it on. And I can see that's really punched up my colors in here. It's also punched my colors in my grievous little bit of bright there. We can also play with some of our other tools, see if like haze removal 
No, but the haze removal messed up this area again and made it made it aggressive and makes it fight the front of my image. So I'm not going to do that. So I actually kind of like this for an edit. It's not the brightest thing. It's not the most aggressive edit I could have done, but it's pretty good. One thing we can also do if we want a selective change, and this works on all the tools, is you have all these options. Parametric mask, drawn mask, uniformly, all of these little things right here. Right now, I just want to show you a drawn mask. And the drawn mask uses a bunch of different tools. Add brush, add circle, add ellipse. I'm going to just use a circle because I want this to be simple. If I was doing it, you know, fancier, I would do more with it. But what I can do is I can just add a circle. Then I can roll my mouse and I can change the dimensions of that circle. So what I want to do is I definitely want all that to have the velvia on it, right? And then this outside one is your feather, and you can change the dimension of the feather. To set that, I use shift and scroll, right? If I just scroll regularly, it, it, it does my, my actual mask. And then if I shift scroll, it allows me to change this outside part of my mask. So I can do that. Now I'm done with this, I don't need this anymore, I can close it back up. And now watch, if I turn off the Velvia, this is an evenly gray image, if I turn it on with the mask, see how I've only added color right here? And now if I flip this on and off real fast, you can see that it's just a circle in the middle of the page, kind of. But if you just see this image online, you're not going to notice that edge, especially with a really nice feather on it. You just don't notice it at all. If you don't use much feather, you're going to notice that edge and it's going to be very, very aggressive. So we want to kind of avoid using a low feather if we can do it. We want really, really big feathers. If we want to see a more aggressive feather, I can show you it on levels. I can do the same thing, draw and mask, add a circle put my circle right there and I can scroll my circle in so we can see and actually let me show you more aggressively using the lack of feather so see what it does to the image you can see that it's applying this effect just where this circle is and it's not applying it outside that circle and if we want to see what we're doing, just turn that off, just close the module, and then we can see our edit. But I don't want that, so we are going to turn off that mask. This is very nice, gets the job done. If I want one of these that is a mask and one of these that is not a mask, all I have to do is come over here and do multiple instances of the action. And then you can do all sorts of stuff, right? Like once you once you get the multiple instances going and your masks going, you can push some parts and pull other parts and add contrast and remove contrast or add saturation, or remove saturation. You can do any of these tools exactly where you want. So man, now with this local contrast, well, I like the local contrast in here, but I don't like it in the back, right? Or I like the haze removal. Yeah, the haze removal is even nicer. I like it here, but it messes up my background. Well, that's easy enough. Let's get in there with the mask. And this time I think I want a different shape, so I'm going to go with an oval. And now the nice thing is, is it's going to give me a tool tip up at the top. So see it says shift click to switch to feathering mode, or to switch feathering mode, control click to rotate. Shift scroll to set feather rate, rate and control scroll to set shape opacity. So I am going to control click to rotate and see how it gives me a little bit of rotation. I like that. Put that maybe like this. Because I really want your eyes like right there, right? And I actually want this a little bit smaller. Right, I really want to punch this handful of flowers and not the rest of it. And then I'm going to shift scroll my feather, make my feather nice and soft, and now I have this haze removal with this nice mask. Close that up, turn that off, so now let's just look at this guy. 
So this is my original image, right? This is with with uh, with the base curve turned off. This is what I start with. Then first, I like to go to levels and kind of punch levels or do whatever you need to make it get the way you want it. Then maybe the haze removal. Then Velvia to get a little bit more of that color. And the Velvia and the haze removal have those masks, so I don't edit this background at all. So it's a really nice, quick way to get a selective edit without having to go in there and you know paint the edges like you may have to uh, in, in some programs. Because really, Darktable is not an editor in the same way that Photoshop is. It's an editor very much like a dark room, and, that, and it keeps you from getting obsessed with the little details. I'm going to do one more. This, same thing. Just went outside and took a picture. You can see that these are going to be my focus. This is going to be a problem because we have lots of contrast throughout this image. This area is actually not very high con very high contrast. I'm going to kill my base curve. Again, that's just the way I like it. Let's see. Shadows and highlights is one of those things that, again, I like just checking on experimentally. Is that a better image than that? And for me, I like pictures like this with lots of you know, stuff going on pretty busy. So I'm going to leave on my shadows and highlights for right now. And come up here, grab levels. Shove the bottom of my levels until I get good darks, right? We want to be in here. We don't want to crush it, though. Get some more light in here. And this is stuff you can do experimentally, right? You can just put it up here and say, nope, that's terrible. Put it back. I'm going to bring this over, right, to try to bring this hump a little smoother because this one, I don't want to be all, you know, gothy and dark. Alright, so that gives me something pretty nice right there. Now, Velvia, let's see. So I'm really concentrating on the yellow of these, so we can use these same same tools, right? We're not using too many tools, because these are just the tools that I like to use. If you need to do other stuff, go find it in the more modules. You can find good documentation about what all these can do, or you can ask me, and I'd be happy to walk you through it. So, Velvia. I'm kind of liking some of this like purple background here is really setting off this yellow a little bit more, but again, we're just too busy in the image, so we can do a very quick drawn mask. We have kind of this vertical shape right here, so let's go ahead and lean into that. And this remembers my settings from last time, which is kind of actually what I want. And I want to punch up these. Right, I've aggressively done this, but now we do have a little bit more purple here than we might want in the rest of the image. Right, that might be a little bit too aggressive as a, di as a difference. Especially if you see it like this, right? You can really see that mask hitting. But here, you might not actually notice that just looking at it. Go to our levels. I actually want to copy my levels. New instance. And I do want mask again. Drawn mask. And this one I'm going to make a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger. And for this, I am going to bring this up. And then let's say I want everything but this area all, which is actually what I want, right? I want to darken up the rest of this to really set off my, my little, my tomates. So for this, I can go down here and I can hit inverse ma invert mask on. So invert mask has now affected everything else in the image. So now I can use this. to give me some of that action. Right. And if I bring this down and this up, I can keep my whites intact while still darkening the image. 
and let's click off so we can kind of see it without that. Now again, this is very aggressive, right? This is much, much more aggressive than I would generally do, but it's important for you guys to see it in this image. You can use this to bring faces out. You can use this to do all sorts of things where you need to attract attention to an area without, you know, really messing with the, with the image. If I wanted to, we could also come in here and just pull this purple out in the same way, but we're getting a little long in this video. So these are the basic tools. Once you're done, you know, double click on the gray, you go back to the basic selection window. This is one of those things where Windows kind of eats itself, where it can't keep track of this. There we go, there's all of our pictures. Um, the Linux one is much more stable. So here's our images. Now, to get these images out, right, these are just edited RAWs. These are raw files that have a list of edits as a separate file. They are not JPEGs that you can get, that you can export. So what we're going to do is just select one of them. You select your target storage, right, export selected down here on the right. Target storage, this is just a folder on my desktop. The file format and quality, I'll just generally leave this alone. Max size, this allows you to set the maximum pixel dimensions of your images. So if you know you're putting like all your stuff up on Twitter, right? There's a size that those images are. Just go look it up, look up what that size is and you can just export for that size. That way you don't have gigantic files, you don't have to worry about sending big files to people and all that stuff. For example, I use some websites where the maximum picture size is 1,000 by 1,000. So I usually have this set to 1,000 by 1,000. If you want the maximum quality, like if you don't want to change the pixel size, set both of these to zero and it will just leave it alone and it will export your images. I generally leave all this stuff alone as well. It, don't mess with it unless you know what you're doing and you know why you're changing it. JPEG, you might, you know, go to PDF or TIFF if you have good, re uh, good reason to do that, or PNG if you're going to a more web-oriented thing. So yeah, so that's all your changes there. You can hit export. I have this image selected. If I want all of them, just shift select and it will select all of them. Hit export, and then it will actually do it as a jobbed file, right? So I'm going to export these. You'll see a little window come up right, right here and it will slowly figure out those images, right? One of four, two of four, three of four, four of four. So as it renders these out to show you on screen, it's not really doing a high quality render. So what you're doing when you hit export is it's taking your original raw, it's taking all the edits in that file, and it's applying them in a very, very high quality way. So when you open those JPEGs, they are as good as they can possibly be. All right, guys, I hope this was helpful for class. If you need help finding a specific module to do a specific thing, please let me know. This is an editor that allows you to do more darkroom work as opposed to Photoshop, painty sort of really heavy editing. And I like it just because it's relatively light, it's relatively fast, and it is free and cross-platform. So I hope you guys get something out of this and enjoy those edits. If there's a specific style I can help you with, that's also something Thing that's relatively easy. I just need to see a photograph that you're trying to duplicate and the photograph that you've taken and then I can help you bridge that gap between those two things.